Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Growth Labs Development Talks seminar series. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Jose Morales Arilla and I will be moderating tonight, today's seminar. Uh, the Growth Labs Development Talks is a series of conversations with policymakers and academics working in international development. Uh, the seminar provides a platform for practitioners and researchers to discuss both the practice of development and analytical work centered on policy. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Chris Flatman, Premier E. Person, Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago's Pearson Institute and Harris School of Public Policy. Chris will discuss his new book, Why We Fight, The Roots of War and the Paths to Peace. Now, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. And so the, the first question I wanted to ask, and you know, this is a fantastic book that presents a cogent framework for why war should be rare, a rare alternative to conflicts. Now, right before the book was published, they, 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 you know, Vladimir Putin decided to invade, invade Ukraine. Uh, how, how would you uh, perhaps outline very quickly the framework that the book presents and how would you perhaps describe that uh, event from the, from the perspective of the arguments uh, uh, outlined in the book? Um, okay, well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been 20 years since I was a student here, so it's nice to be back and uh, talk. It's a trans, the transform play. Um, the, 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 you, yeah, I always knew that a war would break out Sometime around, I mean, unfortunately, war breaks out and something would happen when the book came out. And I, 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 I knew in my heart of hearts that it was going to be a part of the world that I knew precisely zero about, uh, because that's how things work. And so I, I, I don't think I knew precisely zero about, but like most people in this room, I probably couldn't have found, I couldn't have found Donbass on, a, on an unlabeled map uh, six months ago. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, and, and so and it was a weird moment to come out with a, a book that, uh, again, I didn't write a book called Why We Don't Fight, but chapter, is it chapter one is called Why We Don't Fight, because that's the right starting point, because most of the time we don't. And, and but that was also true. So everyone says, well, did this war break out right when the book came out? And, and yes, but two weeks later, India accidentally lobbed a cruise missile at Pakistan in common suit. And, and so we, but we pay attention to, as we should, like a medic, Pays attention to the severely ill, we rush to the to the the the, 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 the direly ill patient, right? And we pay all that attention as we should, but but we can't forget that the normal thing to do in these circumstances is not to is not to fight. That's even true of Ukraine. Um, for 20 years, Vladimir Putin tried every other every other uh, thing possible, from dark money to propaganda uh, to uh, assassinations. Uh, to attempts to co-opt the government, uh, invasion was a last resort, and it was it was a it was a, a, a resort he didn't need to use against most of his other neighbors. He didn't need to in, invade Kazakhstan, or when he did send in the peacekeepers, there was no resistance, and he didn't need it to subjugate Belarus. So, but but I didn't write a book called Why We Don't Fight. I, I wrote a book called Why We Don't Fight, um, and uh, and I think you know the framework works. Reasonably well. Um, if anybody remembers one thing when they leave the room, it's that war is ruinous. We can see that, right? War is ruinous. Uh, and every reason we fight is a reason that one side or the other ignores those costs and goes to war in spite of, in spite of it. And, and so why did Russia ignore the costs and the ruin of war and decide to do this? Um, one is the person in charge didn't bear most of those costs. That's what happens in autocracies. It can even happen in democracies somewhat, but that's what happens. So we've unchecked leaders, so they're too ready to use violence. They might even have a private interest in going to war. In this case, we definitely know he's, Putin is not bearing most of the cost, but he, uh, he, he may, he, what's his private interest? Well, I don't think it's particularly strong, but I, I do think that a Ukrainian democracy was a threat to his regime in the sense that Russians identify with Ukrainians more than anybody else on the planet. Two, they tossed out two Russian-facing leaders in the last 20 years. This is a dangerous example. Not a life-threatening example for him, but, but a dangerous example where there's a benefit to exterminate, you know, extinguishing that flame. Um, the second, the two explanations you hear a lot in the media is that Putin, his cabal, maybe the Russian people sort of, there's this vision of national Russian glory and, and and coming back from past humiliations and getting the game back together with the empire. Those are all stories of there's some ethereal thing that they get through war that they can't get otherwise, right? So they're willing to pay some costs. 
to go to war. And those kinds of intangible incentives are often really important. I think we exaggerate that in this case, but I think they're, they're part of it. The other story you hear is about Vladimir Putin and his regime's misperceptions, how they, they got it wrong. Right? They erroneously believed that they'd be able to sort of sweep in almost like an intelligence operation and, and, uh, and replace the government with a puppet regime. Frankly, could have happened, I think. It wasn't totally out of the, out of, out of the realm of possibility. Zelensky could have gotten on that plane. I think he surprised everybody, maybe even himself. Um, so that's certainly true, right? An isolated, insulated leader sort of made the wrong gamble. But that, that I think, understates like what, what I think is the fourth root of a lot of wars. And it's just sheer uncertainty, right? We emphasize that, oh, ex post, he got it wrong. So he must have been misperceiving, but actually it's really hard to get these things, right? Like, like think of this, how many people, think, think of the, the, the strength of Western unity on this and the, uh, the pluckiness and, and, and effectiveness of the Ukrainians and then the inefficacy of, of the bundlingness of the initial Russian invasion. So all three things were like within the realm of possibilities, right? But nobody predicted that Putin would get a bad draw on all three, least of all Vladimir Putin. Uh, and so, so there, this was a gamble. War is always a gamble of this uncertainty. So it's not just misperception. Um, and the last is sort of the fifth, uh, I make an argument for in the paper is commitment problems where it's hard to hold to a deal. I think that's the least important. It's often the most important in a lot of conflicts, especially long ones. I think it's, we can talk more later in questions about why I think commitment problems are pretty hard in the war. But you can think of commitment problems as, as you just don't trust the other side to hold up to a deal. Um, and I think uh, Ukrainians have been unable to make a deal that would satisfy Russia and it's rising, it's, it's far more powerful, it's in a position to demand more. Ukrainians were unable to implement the Minsk Accords and, and I think Putin couldn't trust them to implement anything because they perceive it as unjust in which they screw this. Uh, and likewise, no one trusts Putin because of his ideological stance. And so we're, I think there's almost an ideological problem at work here that, that contributed. But for me, most of all, it's the unchecknedness of Putin and the uncertainty. And it's less about those intangible glory incentives and the misperceptions that you read the papers. Hmm. No, fantastic. And, and as, as, as I was reading the book, and uh, you know, this was, I, I, I was reading it as, I, as the conflict was happening. And, and uh, I, I, I took issue a little bit with this, uh, with the idea of tinkering, right? Like the, as the path to building peace, right? On, on, on the one hand, Right, like uh, uh, the, there's the, the the sense that you know you should go through in any policy around with like iterative adaptation, almost scientifically. You know, uh, 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 as as any good student of uh, Matt Andrews and, and Len Bridget, I, I treasure that, that view and, and all of that. I, I find that fantastic. But at the same time, it's like the, the the sort of almost kitchen sink reaction of the of the West uh, to the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, not only seems a little bit inconsistent with the idea of, of tinkering, but at the same time, when I was seeing those reactions, I was like, "Yes, yes, this is right. Like this is this is how you react to something like this." Uh, so, 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 how would you how would you balance that? Uh, 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 what what do you think the, the the what's your opinion about the West reactions to to, to the invasion of Ukraine and and how, what do you think should have been done? Um. So yeah. So I the last book is. The last chapter of the book I called Peaceful Engineering, uh, after this idea from Karl Popper, the Peaceful Social Engineer. But I, I, I make my little dad joke and I spell peace, P-A-C-E. Uh, <laughs> and, but it's very much a book that actually probably shows my Kennedy School roots. And it's not just Matt Andrews and Matt Pritchett, Marilyn Grindle, uh, Danny Roderick, um, and uh, uh, Catherine, like so many other, so many, I actually teach a class on this, and, just, and, and, and it was only when Lamp Pritchett, I said in my syllabus, he's like, oh, I didn't realize there was a Kennedy School of, School of Thought until I, <laughs> uh, until I saw the syllabus. And it's about this piecemeal approach to policy change, but it's much bigger than that. It's Jane Jacobs, and it's James Scott, and it's so many great, everyone has figured out why some policies work and some policies fail. I think have stumbled upon the fact that if you try to do grand things, they will go wrong. Uh, now, what do you do in the middle of a war? Well, how you I'm not going to tell people how to fight a war. A kitchen sink approach to fighting, maybe that's the right approach. Maybe peaceful engineering works. I've never been on a battlefield, so I don't want to say. 
Um, I think that you have to, it was, I wanted to finish the book in a way that says, okay, like, I'm not going to give some big, like, Stephen Pinker style, everything is going to be better. And I didn't, you know, because, because, he, and he's someone I admire, but I just don't agree with that in this situation. Bill Easterly is a good friend of mine. And I didn't want to end on, we're done. What can you do? Right. And, and, you know, as much as he would like me to end it that way, um, I wanted to be constructive. So imagine you're the, but you have to think, like, what can one individual or one institution do? So if you're the Turkish president, right, or you're the Israeli prime minister or something, what can you do? Well, I think you need to work on the margin. You need to think about what's the one or two actions I can invest in that are going to solve one of these. I, there's, there's five problems here that we need to work. What can I do to solve them? There's a, there's a lack of dialogue and a lack of trust that's contributing to uncertainty commitment problems, or I'm in a position to actually try to reduce some of those tensions. Grain's not getting out. Well, I'm just going to focus on, on, on trying to get the grain out and trying to cleverly find a deal or a set of incentives or arrangements. Or I'm the head of the Treasury Department. I'm going to try to make a sanctions regime that much more effective, aware of all the limitations of, of both targeted and generalized sanctions. Right. So I think that's that's just how any individual organization has to act. Um, and anyone who tried to act more boldly or broadly than that would be in that. And you're probably not going to be very effective at your piecemeal approach either. It's just super hard. But but it's your I think it's your only hope of like making any kind of difference in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. No, that's it, one, one of the points that the, the book highlights also is this idea that economic interdependence is a bad piece. Um, I, I, I somewhat uh, uh, reacted to that from, from a view like, okay, uh, in the 90s, we had these views of like the, the path for Chinese democracy is, uh, is, uh, is straight, right? Or, or the path to civilize Russia is by you know, interconnecting oil imports from Germany, right? But then now, you know, 30 years later, we find that, you know, it is, it is American firms that are like trying to needing to commit to censorship guidelines from, from, from the Chinese uh, government just to be able to supply that market. Or, you know, it's Germany, the one that is relatively timid in responding to, 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 to the Russian invasion, right? So, so, so on one hand, it's, maybe that's the point, right? Like, uh, whenever you have economic interests intertwined with a rival, then you're a bit more cautious on how you respond. But at the same time, it also feels like dictatorships are a bit more bullish or a bit more, more hawkish in that interaction, which, you know, maybe that means that it doesn't use speed, but it qualifies the kind of piece that comes up as one that is perhaps a, a enabling the, 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 the autocratic side of things. So, so yeah, so how, how would you think that, that democracy should uh, react in, in a way that prevents that from happening without compromising economic integration? Yeah. So I mean, one thing I'm really careful to emphasize in the beginning is that peace isn't necessarily just. And, and when, when I talk about peace, especially in the first part of the book, I don't label it as such, but there's this idea of negative peace that exists in like the peace building literature. When someone says negative peace, they just mean you're not fighting. You hate one another. You may be on the cusp. It's just sort of brinksmanship, but you're not fighting because it doesn't make sense. You just loathe in peace and you, you, you struggle for advantage. And that's kind of the world we live in most of the time, especially with the most serious adversaries. Um, and, and that piece can also be, not only is it hostile, it can be unjust in the sense that a powerful actor can get something that seems like an undeserving share, or they can do things that, that, that seem morally outrageous to many of us. And, and we kind of have to live with it because that's, that's what peace means, right? So when a, when a, over when like a when a cabal rules a country and subjugates all the serfs or all of the commoners or whatever you know, uh, or a minority group exploits a majority group or or a majority group exploits a minority group that's and the, and the, and that that exploited group doesn't revolt that which is most human societies for most of history that's peace but that's not just. Um, being entwined with a dictator, someone who's not encumbered by, uh, by the, can, can sort of take aggressive actions without bearing the cost, that's a bargaining chip in their favor, right? They have more power than you do in some sense because they can threaten to burn the whole house down more credibly than you can. 
And uh, and so that's always going to be a bargaining chip in their favor. And that's going to lead to a split in the world or in your society, whatever level we're talking about, that, that gives them an advantage. That's tragic to me, but it's how it, how it is. Um, economic interdependence in those situations to a first approximation, right? it's not a magic solution, but to a first approximation is like speed bumps for them on their road to using violence, right? So they're going to wield lots of tools to gain advantage. And what economic interdependence does is it says, I'm less likely to use the tools that are going to blow up the thing that's pumping money into my economy, into my pocketbook. And so I'll use assassinations and, uh, and dark money and propaganda and polit political finagling and, and, and rhetoric and, and instead of violence. Um, and that's, a, that's an improvement, I think. But, uh, but, but it's not like, that's, that's not like the happy, it's not a happy message to sort of carry and say that's good enough, but, but it's, it's, it's important to recognize. It's hard to put in the bumper sticker, but yeah. it's good. <laughs> Oh, I, I understand. I, I another thing I also really enjoyed about the book is the 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 underscoring of the concept of polycentricity, right? Like this idea that maybe there are institutional arrangements that can organically come about without coercive means uh, to to build things, right? And then uh, you you make this fabulous discussion of the uh, the case of the gangs in Medellin, which is a setting that you've uh, done some fantastic research around about. Uh, I, I find that super interesting, but at the same time, uh, I feel like it's, it's often the case that the Colombian case uh, is used in conversation to kind of underscore a different, kind of more Hobbesian kind of uh, narrative, right? Of the, it's important to have like the primacy of the state as a, as a monopolist of violence in the country. And then it's actually when the policy is uh, kind of pursued that, you know, they, uh, it's only until the government gave war a chance that, you know, things kind of started to improve and that actually a meaningful negotiation with the guerrillas could start to happen because attempts to negotiate negotiation had happened in the past and they had break, they break, uh, broken down. So, so how would you respond to that, right? Like to that tension of should we, should we aim for like state monopoly and which again is this view of like massive, uh, you know, transformational like change of things, uh, or uh, from the perspective of like the argument for for tinkering, and, and how do you react to that in that particular setting of the Colombian story? So I think I need to clarify. So I mean, when you say give for a chance, I mean they thought they fought a fifty year civil war. It's like one of the longest civil wars in the history of the world. So and are you thinking like that helped build make the state stronger and? I'm not, I'm not saying I think I think that yeah, I'm saying it's a narrative that's out there about Colombia that says that says like it is until the uh, uh, the early 2000s that an effort to voice oh, uh, overpower the guerrillas uh, came about. I see, got you. So um and or a renewed effort to overpower the guerrillas. Yeah, I mean for me, Colombia is like one of the great tragedies because here's it's one of those successful dynamic places on the planet. It really is it's it's a thriving democracy in so many ways. They're, they have so much to potentially export, do. It should be this mar this economic and political marvel for the whole hemisphere. And it is kind of getting to that now. It's kind of underperformance for reasons I don't understand. And yet it wasted 50 years in this sort of low scale, occasionally intense insurgency. Um, so, so what would I say? I would say um, we shouldn't mix up things you do to win a war versus things you do to find a peace, right? So the, the thing that one side won, right? The government won, basically. Amazingly, the government basically won. Uh, and um, the question is, like, what was the alternative path that, that could, have, could have ended this war sooner? Um, I don't know this for a fact, because this is, I, when I work, in, I work in organized crime, crime wars, I don't work on the Korea and, and this, this sort of history. But one thing that happened repeatedly over 50 years, and this is here's a commitment, this is the Colombia is like the poster child for the commitment problem and why it's hard to end a civil war. Because in a civil war, unlike an international war, any kind of internal war, one side has to put down their guns, at least, right? And then decide to join a, a political process. It's usually what happens. And when you put down your guns, you have to trust that the the, the, especially if you're a smaller group, that the larger group is not going to murder you. Every time 
I mean, the, the, the Garisha were horrible in many, many ways. But every time they tried to put down their guns, either the government or some splinter faction within the government and military tried to assassinate them. And they went, right, because we can't do that. Again and again and again. And then they finally put down their guns. And what's happened in the last few years? How many, a thousand leftist leaders have been murdered? Secretly? You know, who knows? They don't, is there a serious investigation? I mean, it, it, it's, it's astonishing. Um, so the continuation of that war was, I just think, a self-inflicted wound. And I think Colombia isn't a Costa Rica, partly because of that today. It's just a, so I see it as a big failure in that sense. It's fantastic. Uh, I guess we have time for one more question before we move to, to questions from the audience. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the book makes a, a very nuanced point about the merits of foreign intervention, right? Like on the one hand, highlighting the, the potential concerns about like, you know, side effects on the population whenever these interventions happen, but at the same time, highlighting the, the promise of incentivizing a peaceful solution between potentially warring parties or preventing a massacre whenever like conflict starts. So, so that, that, that to me seems kind of nuanced, and, and I was wondering if you could perhaps uh, highlight it or uh, elaborate a bit more on your views about like the role for foreign intervention in building peace, right? Like what's, what's, the, what's the point that the book makes on, on this? Yeah, I think when you, you emailed me this question in advance, you asked me what's the Blackman Doctrine? Uh -huh, what's the Blackman Doctrine? doctrine? <laughs> Which is a great question for to ask anybody, like what's their doctrine? Um, <laughs> so on the one hand, it, I, so I, the reason I like that is that, you know, that whole piecemeal engineer approach sort of says, well, there is no one size fits all solution. And that's like the classic mistake that we make. So I think it, it is a mistake to think that there's one doctrine and that we can apply that to Syria. And that, will, which is, you know, which is a very different kind of political conflict than like, what should the international community or the United States do in Colombia, where you have sort of a drug fuel paramilitary and Guerrilla fighting a government. Like that's, so I don't know that there's a single, there, so there's not a single doctrine is an unsatisfying answer, but I think there are some principles. Um, so three, three things that I, let me just say a few things that I think are, I think are not talked about, but I think would be huge if, if progress was made. One would just be, I'd like to see a lot more supranational institutions. All right. Uh, I, well, I, some people would say multilateralism. I don't like that word. It doesn't really mean what I mean. So what do I mean? I mean, so an easy one is I'd like to see, like, the United States sign on to things like the International Criminal Court. Right. I would like to see a more the sanctions response. Right. Which was not rules based and not predictable. I would like to see. I would like to see more rules based predictable, institutionalized responses to specific kinds of crimes and invasions, right? So International Criminal Court is one, but something that's sort of institutionalized. It doesn't have to be everybody, right? You just need a cluster of people to start and do that. I would like to see some more, because the more predictable it is, the more it's going to, I think, more effective the deterrent. At, at a, but I'd also like to see like more East, I'd like to, see we should be pushing, we should be encouraging this movement towards an East African Union, which is happening regionally, but we should be encouraging that because I think that's going to be incredibly pacifying for that region. It's also going to create a lot of checks and balances and otherwise highly centralized regimes, which are fundamentally unstable. We could see Uganda and Rwanda implode. And, and I think the more supranational union there is there, whether it's currency unions, trade unions, political unions, would be very stabilizing. Do the same thing with ECOWAS in West Africa. Like take these nascent movements, and rather than have all of our development, diplomacy, and humanitarian organizations push them in a individualized nationalistic direction and disincentivize them towards this natural, seemingly very popular path towards union, actually try to point in the other direction. So I think that would be hugely stabilizing. So that's one thing nobody talks about that I just think would just be so, so important. Um, for a lot of things, good policy, but also peace. And then the second thing is I'm very, I used to be very optimistic about the, the, the ability to wield military power to end civil wars because I work in Liberia and I witnessed things happen in Liberia next door in Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, like all these huge success stories of military intervention. 
that don't get talked about because they, they were over in a few months, it didn't lead to a 20 year conflict. But despite that, I've tempered my enthusiasm because I, I think it's super unpredictable. And so the other thing I think about is, and it's linked to my first point about predictable rules-based orders, when there are violators, when there are people fighting civil wars or there's a, a Bashir in Syria, I think my, my instinct is the thing that might be productive is just to, you might not be able to stop that conflict. I think there's lots of things you could do and, and I would advocate for that, but I would just make life miserable for those people, for those leaders who made those decisions for the rest of their lives. Um, even at the risk of extending that civil war. Again, because of a unevidence based, non evidence based faith in the deterrent effect of that for the next Bashir. Um, I just think it's this terrible trade off that one would have to make. But I do think, I do think we, I think, I think, I think that that makes me that sort of rules based, predictable order that if you go that route, we're going to make this, we're going to, all that, all those incentives you have for your private benefits and the, the costs you're not going to bear, we're going to zero in on that. And you're just going to really regret this no matter what. And I would like to change the calculus of future. Uh, it's very interesting that once you make it a rule, there's no going back. And then it's like, maybe they, right, like if you want to make the point for, a, for mm -hmm. another point, it's like your decision on this is taken. It's a rule. And the problem though, is that when that war does, because when wars will break out still, right? Because you, it's going to look like your rule was made no sense because you're going to only see the cases where it failed to deter the war. So there's a real selection problem in how we evaluate if this is a good idea or not. And then it's going to make it harder to end those conflicts. Because ending those conflicts means going to the Bashirs and saying, you know what? You'll do fine. Like you just, just put down your, we're going to take care of you if you can just stop fighting. And that's a really tough spirit. That's uh, fantastic. I think we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, yes. Um, so first, I think, thank I think we need to for that. Oh, okay. First, thank you. And I just want to say, I hope I'm not the only person in this audience situation of not having read the book yet. But now I really want to read the book, but it may be useful for other people. Just if you could give like a thumbnail sketch of your argument about the what are the roots of war and what is the path to peace. Yeah. And then the kind of the follow-up question is about this, this notion of something I very much agree with the need for a rule-based predictable international order. Uh, but you didn't say, haven't said anything really about international law. Yeah. And the truth is there is a rule-based international order. It's called international law around aggressive war. It's been constructed very slowly since the interwar period, okay? Yeah. And it's very hard to produce a new one. And for example, the U.S. will never ratify the ICC. As a political scientist, I promise you, yes. two-thirds of the U.S. Senate and presidential system will never do it. So, we, so some of those suggestions, it's not going to work. Yeah. Politically, it's not going to work. And so we're kind of stuck politically with some of that. You know, the Security Council is not going to go away. The fact that the Security Council makes decisions about war and peace is not going to disappear. We're not going to be able to create a new body that can do that. So from a political point of view, uh, you know, how do you, you know, completely endorse the idea of there are things that can be done, yeah. but some of them like U.S. ratify ICC or change the Security Council aren't going to happen. Yeah. So. Um, great. So what would I say? So thumbnail sketch. Well, let me give the, because I'm, because I'm here at Harvard, let me give the, Slightly, I think to do the thumbnail sketch, I need to give you the academic version, which will resonate for some people. Um, what I tried to do is sort of take the book is not really about my ideas in the most part. The book is my attempt to like synthesize 50 years of both like psychology, sociology, economics, politics, and make the, the game theoretic approach to thinking about conflict talk to the non game theoretic approach, which is often does not. And so uh, and the, the starting point is the idea that there are, whether it's shelling or a whole body of labor economics or law and economics, and eventually the study of conflict by people like Jim Fearon was to say, well, the starting point is to say we shouldn't fight because it's costly. And this is a powerful incentive. And then two of the reasons we fight are, are these sort of classic, what people call rationalist bargaining failures and commitment problems and the role of uncertainty. And then I say, well, that's great. And, and for the average, you know, for a normal person who's never heard of these things before, which is a travesty because they're like some of the most powerful ideas of political science and, and game theory, and, and people should at least be aware of them. Um, 
And, and for the, the political economists and, and some political scientists, they've just never synthesized and really thought carefully and tried to organize and systematically think through the other reasons we might fight. And, and unchecked leaders is basically actually kind of in theoretic it's saying there's principal agent problems, like the person who's taking the decision is unaccountable. And then the other two, which are these intangible shadows and misperceptions, is the way. So, how would, how would behavioral scientists think about that? They'd say, well, we have non standard preferences, meaning we might value things that are, we have a utility function that has more than just territory in it, right? We value glory or things. And then we also have misperceptions, which are the systematic ways in which we get that bargaining calculus wrong. Most of all, we misestimate the probability of, of winning, or and we misestimate the actions of our enemies. And so I try to walk through carefully. like So it's in a way, it's trying to popularize a lot of social science on this. Um, and then the path to peace is like, what do we know concretely about rolling those things back? Um, then like, yeah, so, okay, so uh, of my, some of the things that I talked about are, a lot of things I, I talked about are very hard to do. Like East African Union, there's lots of, just as there's like domestic political forces in the US that prevent any international cooperation of this nature, that's, that's fundamentally why I think East African Union will maybe never emerge, not emerge in my lifetime as a real political entity or ECOWAS for that matter. That said, I do think there's things on the margin that one could do to at least, right now we've disincentivized that so much as international community and actually distort domestic incentives uh, in the wrong way. Um, and so, so I think that would be something to think about shifting on the margin over say a decade. Uh, and then the US, well, so I'm both as pessimistic as you, but more optimistic in the sense that I don't believe that the UN Security Council would exist in 100 years. And I don't, I'm not sure our current system of government in the United States, this exact, I think it will probably exist in hundred years. There might be some changes on the margin. The dysfunctionality and our inability to create anything, let alone an international agreement because of the system of government is like a really deeply rooted problem. At least the way the parties have, the set of co political coalitions that have formed, I, I think the only way this happens is the political coalitions in this country change for some reason, which, and so in a hundred years, I think, It'll be different. Um, so I don't think it's going to happen next year. Uh, so that's not a very, so that's kind of pessimistic. Um, so there's some of these things, but I, I, you know, I do think we're going to see some real movement on these over the span of decades. I, I agree. Some of the, my Blattman doctrine was super high in the sky long term. And I actually think those things will come about. I think I can't imagine, I'd be very, very surprised if in 100 years we don't have. Uh, a set of European Union like regional units rather than this more atomized sort of, sort of system of nation states. I just don't think Sub Saharan Africa and other parts of the world will be able to advance without them. And so I think the incentives are too powerful. But that's that's kind of a, that's another, that would be a different. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, hello again, Chris. Uh, since Jose mentioned Hobbes, I wanted to be Hobbes' lawyer and ask you a question uh, that came up to me when I read the book, which is uh, how, you know, from this perspective, more, more political philosophy stemming from a Hobbesian uh, view, a rule based international order is impossible without an, an authority, no? without a sovereign. Um, peace is impossible without. A sovereign or authority to to actually enforce that rule, and that has to do. Uh, so, what what do you think of that? How is it possible? Uh, how you know? How do you answer to that? Um, and this also has to do with the fact, for me, an innovative way of thinking, for because of my ignorance of that literature, uh, of treating you know conflict in war the same as conflict within a state or within a civil a civil conflict, you know, gangs uh, or, you know, a war between states in the end, from this perspective, again, theoretical perspective, can be understood with a similar lens, with a same lens. But, you know, Hobbes would say, no, that's completely different uh, because war is, doesn't happen within a state. 
uh, that's security issues, war is between the, at the international level. Mm -hmm. And that, that has consequences for how to understand peace and how to build peace. And if it's needed uh, authority or not, what type of, uh, so yeah. So yeah, so I mean, Hobbes wrote the life in after experiencing and I mean, actually fleeing from the English Civil War. Um, it was very front of mind. That said, my understanding, I might be wrong because I'm not a theorist, is um, when he, what he calls war, it's a little W-A-R-R-E, um, he doesn't actually mean fighting, right? That's inclusive, but he actually means a sort of tense posturing, this sort of hostility. That's like the natural state of humankind. And, and, and fighting is not necessarily. So there's not so much inconsistency in that sense between what I'm arguing with. Office argue. Um, and then, so the, the question is then, how do you have, within that, how do you have more war in the sense of hostile posturing and less violent fighting? And, and I think of the, the Leviathan, the overarching ruler, was like his idea of, uh, you know, what he, what he was pushing. Uh, so how would we do that in a rules-based international order? So I'm not a scholar of international order or international law, and, and I'm only learning that. So where do I where do I see the like? Let me give you the example of the international order in Medellin, Colombia, where you have 400. It, it, the analogy and the way in which I think these ideas operate at different levels is really really important. And 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 of course, like criminal groups and nations are super different. Right? But I think we learn, we can learn a lot from seeing what they have in common sometimes. So for 10 years, there are 400 street gangs and maybe 17 higher level mafia-like organizations in the city, 12,000 armed, mostly young men. Um, and the homicide rate currently is about a third of that in Chicago. They've managed to establish a, a piece, they call it El Pacto del Fusil, the Pacto of the Machine Gun, uh, for a decade. Um, and it took them a long time. There's been repeated bouts of war. And when Medellin goes to war, it becomes the most violent place on the planet, literally. You know, homicide rates in the 1990s reached 400 per 100,000, which is about you know 10 times that of like some of the most violent American cities right now, and multiples of civil wars. Um, okay, how did they do it? They um, they have built, they've constructed all sorts of norms. Right. So, for example, early on, they tried to the the, the, the higher level mafia like organizations called the Corazones and the Combos tried to establish a set of norms that they would follow and then try to for enforce through essentially mutual sanctions. One of those norms was we're not going every Corazon has a bunch of affiliated Combos. We're not going to steal your Combos. We're going to create a norm that you don't steal another because that just creates, not only does it create like a lot of unstable shifting coalitions, right, which can create lots of weird game theoretic dynamics that could lead to strategic war, just sort of destabilizes any prior agreement. Interestingly, like the oldest peace agreement, one of the oldest peace agreements we know of, the 30 years peace that tried to avert the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, that was like rule number one they put in there, which was we're not going to steal each other's city states. Okay, so there's some basic principles is like we're going to try to maintain stable coalitions because it's easier for stable coalitions to bargain than for unstable coalitions to bargain. Um, they try to instill norms of you're not allowed to kill somebody without asking permission. You're allowed to kill somebody because you'll have to kill people a lot of the time, but you have to ask permission, at least through your side of them. All right, so they did that. They also established what in, in international relations we would call hegemonic alliances, meaning the Rasson would have a bunch of combos underneath it in that stable coalition, and the Rasson would direct the political activities of the combos so that they can negotiate on their behalf. Right? In international relations, we have a hegemonic alliance with the United States or the Americas. We have another hegemonic alliance, which is China. We have a hegemonic alliance uh, in Russia. We have a headed by Russia, we have a hegemonic alliance headed by the the European Union, and that's a much more that's much easier to find stable bargains than um, than than two hundred atomized countries. 
just like it's, this is easier to find stability than 400. So I can go on and on, but they've constructed a bunch of formal and informal rules and institutions and norms that have made it easier to look to, to basic, and, and they've constructed sanctions regimes and they've and, and targeted sanctions regimes and, uh, and um, peacekeepers and all sort of analogs to all the tools we use. They have mediators. All right, and the government facilitates this. All right, so when a war started to break out to you know, 2019, all the leaders are in jail, by the way. This is useful because um, it means they're on the same cell blocks. They put them in the same cell blocks and they, they can, it's useful for peace. It's not useful for making them less powerful. It's useful for peace because they can negotiate really easily and they can make long term commitments to one another that they trust more because you can go across the hallway and at least talk about it or but con, you know, you wield some consequences. Um, but uh, when war was breaking out, the government transferred all of the leaders on the same day by coincidence. And they all ended up in the same holding block because they're scattered across different prisons. There's so many of them. And they all ended up in the same holding block. And then they arrest a mediator, sort of the equivalent of like Jonathan Powell or something of the criminal world. And, uh, and he accidentally gets sent to the same holding cell. And a week later, the homicide rate is back down to its normal level. And they have a new, you know, they've reinforced the fact that they So, um, so there's lots of little things they've done on the margin to establish peace. And it's super fragile and perfect, just like our international institutions are. And so that's kind of like this piecemeal engineering. I think the slow trying to construct these things. Uh, and it's, it's, and frankly, it seems easier in that gene than it is in the international realm. In the context of piecemeal interventions, something that I, I found supremely interesting in the book is the, the bringing psychology in, right? Like, and, and this idea that therapy can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, prevent the, the worst tendencies of war passions, right? Like, and, and, and actually bring, uh, lower uh, participation. In. And, and, and I think that this seems like especially relevant in post conflict settings where you have a, you know, large amount of young, unskilled, otherwise unskilled uh, males uh, that became really good at one thing, right? Uh, and then how do you prevent them from exploiting that economic opportunity to rekindle conflict? Uh, whenever... so, so I was wondering if you could talk about what the book uh, uh, discusses on, on these things, but also like what your research says on these things uh, on, on post-conflict settings and uh, yeah, transitional policies and also like the psychology, the psychological interventions to moderate uh, and these tendencies. Yeah, so uh, so some of my own work has been in West Africa and now Chicago at this very micro level, right? So I don't I'll usually operate at the level of Ukraine and Russia, but at a very micro level, how do you stop small armed groups from fighting and how do you stop individuals from fighting? And one thing that seems to be very effective is one of many tools is carbon behavioral therapy, um, which is a, doing two things. One, it's, I think, helping people reduce their misperceptions. Certain types of misperceptions, automatic misperceptions are slowing down their thinking, making fewer mistakes. And um, it's also helping people transition to social identities that where there are existing norms of nonviolence. You don't have to create norms of nonviolence. That's super hard. You harness the fact that they exist, that as sort of chimps, we will adopt the, uh, we will just sort of inherently sort of strive towards whatever is valued in our group. And if you just get them to think they belong to this group, then the idea is that people will change their behavior to comport to the norms of that group. And, and well, cognitive behavioral therapy is one way to do that. Now, the implication is not that Vladimir Putin needs cognitive behavior. I mean, Vladimir Putin probably does need cognitive behavioral therapy. Most of us can benefit from this, but that's not the international relations or the broader insight. The broader insight is what is this a microcosm of? This is a microcosm of the fact that our misperception, we do have a capacity for misperceptions, not only as individuals, but in groups. Those are we have slightly different misperceptions in groups than we do, I think, as individuals. But the fact is, is that organizational rules and structures and institutionalized rules and norms, I think, are the way that the human societies have successfully minimized 
or reduced our capacity for misperceptions and improved decision making. Um, and norms help enforce certain bad behaviors, or sometimes they inform, they, they sometimes do the opposite, but norms can shape them. And so I think that's the insight we get that's sort of common across all these things. And so so I I, I try to illustrate some of the commonalities and and it's not a book about individual violence but I but I sometimes I use that because we have a lot of evidence at the individual level on like how to solve misperceptions and we have really limited evidence at the group level so it's almost like we have to try to learn something about groups by taking what we know as about individuals and extrapolating with caution that's it. we have a we have a great question from the audience uh, from the Zoom audience. Uh, so, Professor Blattman, what, uh, what you mentioned about social leaders in Colombia as, as the flagship uh, of the commitment problem is very interesting and thought provoking when implementing peace and possible future agreements of or subjugation laws. But at what level does coordination failures in the Colombian civil conflict within the military and paramilitary redux uh, allegedly behind leftist and environmental leader assassinations? So I think that's a great, yeah, we're definitely getting to like the, if the book is like, actually the book is in 101, I think the book is 201, and then this is like a 301 question. Um, one of my favorite books, there's a, a political scientist at Northwestern England, Wendy Perlman, who um, actually, my favorite book of all time, she, she's written a book about Syria, which is just the dialogue that she's received from her ethnographic interviews. And she doesn't even write it, it's just structured. That's beautiful. Um, but a really deep, another deep book, her first book is about the palace, Israel Palestine. And it's about, uh, and it's about this, is it, it's fundamentally about splinter groups and the difficulties of holding together a stable coalition and how that is inherently a persistent source of violence. And I see this as a little bit of a commitment problem and a little bit of the principal age of the unchecked leaders, all right? It's, it's sort of a, an amalgam of these things. And it says that two unified groups have a very easy time, have very, very clear incentives to not fight. But if one or both of those groups has fragmentary groups with private interests, whether they're ideological or material, and keeping the fight going, this could be people who make their money, they're warlords, and they make their money through fighting, or they could be ideologically committed to sticking it to the other side, uh, or they could think they can seize power in this group by sort of exploiting certain popular sentiments, right? So you can see this on both sides of the Columbia conflict. You can see this on both sides of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. That's much less stable. And what she traces out, I think, really persuasively is that she says, well, actually, this is a hundred year dispute. It's only been extremely violent in maybe a fifth or fewer of those years. So it comports with this idea that most of the time we don't fight. We don't, of course, we focus on all the fighting, uh, but mostly it's a negative piece and that it's like low scale violence. It's not actually, and the, the actual wars can be very brief, like maybe two weeks long. And what she traces is maybe from 2000 to 2015, which is the most violent period of this hundred years, is she traces that to, uh, this fragmentation of control on one side or the other. She's mostly focused on the Palestinian side and how that undermines the basic consensus for peace. And I think that that is that's a big risk. And in political science, we talk about those as spoiler problems and splinter groups. And this is like a fundamental, and it's this basic problem of unstable coalitions. And it's really hard to avoid. Yeah, there's this, this issue, this, this concept that I've, I've seen a, a around in some of these contexts like uh, you know the, the leader the leader of retreat and, and in a way it's like the, the you know the, 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 the heroes in solving many of these contexts say at some point were the ones that were putting a position of authority by a group and now you're solving the situation by betraying the reasons that they put you there so it, 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 and then maybe that opens the room for others like below to try to challenge your position in that leadership uh, uh, in that authority position. So so it's like a, a pretty unstable of a reforming leader that wants to find a compromise whenever polarization is such that yeah. reaching to that authority level, uh, 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 what pays off together is like actually challenging the other side. Or okay, so it's even worse than that. Okay, for the following, so let's think about this current conflict. Ukraine versus Russia, but you could you can imagine this happening in any number of conflicts. Um, each side, Zelensky and Putin, has incentives 
to infuriate their own coalition and make them so livid and outraged at what the other side is doing that they refuse to compromise. All right. Now, partly this is a way to get people to fight. It's a way to sort of strengthen your bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis your adversary, because ideological rewards for fighting are cheaper than material rewards. You don't have to pay them as much. Um, but what it also does is like there's this part, like the cost of work creates this bargaining space between the two sides, where both sides for something within that bargaining range to fighting. But there's a whole set of those bargains are unfavorable to you. If you can make people willing to fight just to stick it to the other person, or so outraged, I will never reward Russia. I will not give them one inch of territory because of uh, because because other uh, just on principle. Not only might it encourage people in the future, just on principle, I've been convinced through that. If you foster that, then you can go as Zelensky to the market negotiating table, which will eventually may happen, and say, "Look, what can I do? Like we could agree on this." But I'll never, it'll never happen. They'll still overthrow. Me. It's a way to tie your hands. So it's actually a strategy, and it's one that is used at every level: ethnic groups, civil wars, international wars. Um, and both sides often do it. And the side that's most effective at it often gets the better deal, right? And not only because they shut off all sorts of bargains, but because it strengthened their military capabilities. Unless both sides overshoot the mark, and there's zero room for a compromise that anybody will accept. And I think some of the most intractable conflicts in the world, like Israel-Palestine and maybe Ukraine-Russia, have reached this space where for ideological, seemingly justified reasons, right? Because all these totally reasonably outraged, I'm outraged, they've eliminated the space where they will actually bargain because some compromises are too important. That's a psychological explanation for conflict that I don't think we've explored enough as a profession. Uh, and I think it's so important for the, these intractable conflicts. And, and it's, but it's a psychological explanation that's strategic in the sense that we have as leaders incentives to create it. So it's totally, anyways, kind of tra it's tragic, tragic, but that's an angle. And oh, we have a question, Marla. Um. Um, oh, hi, sorry. So uh, I just had a question. So um, because from what I understand, the you know, they talk a lot about how this is a uh, violent conflict has gone down a lot. Right. And they, they link a lot of this to the rise in democracy. So I'm wondering, because there is a lot of, um, I guess, backstepping, or I don't know how to put that, like there, there's a lot of um, where there used to be democratic gains, there is kind of a loss at the moment. Yeah. Um, do you say anything about that um, and that, like how that's connected to conflict? Also, because um, when you when you look at like the great powers in history, you know, you talk about the Pax Britannica. There is a lot of um, challenge to uh, the U.S. as the hegemonic power, right? And, and that has a lot to do with the the, the Russian conflict as well. I, I just wondered if you had any like insights about that. I didn't understand the second question. Um, there's that there's this um when you when you talk about great powers in international affairs right um the united kingdom and then um the long piece of the uk right and then now you have the us as uh, supposedly the um hegemonic power in the world and you know what with the us um kind of reneging on a lot of international uh, fora and you have um non-us uh powers trying to kind of challenge that yeah. do you think that that um would be more um, not construct, what do you call it, conducive to conflict. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so in some ways, I think the two answers are linked. So, where violence has clearly tended to go down over time is within societies. I mean, and it's particularly within societies where there's a leviathan, but maybe not just a leviathan in the strong state and order, but but as you say, more. Checked and balanced. You say Democrat, I would say Democrat in the sense we more checked and balanced. Elections may be important, but checked and balanced societies with stronger states have managed to drastically reduce violence within their borders. And then the Pax Americana or the Pax Romana or the Pax, uh, 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 you know, probably, you know, well, there have been lots of empires in history. Not all the Pax Mongolica was not particularly peaceful, but, um, but they act a little bit like that within their sphere of influence. 
they tend to curve, they create order and curve conflict. It's not necessarily just, but, but they do so. Then there's violence between these societies, whether it's these empires or between nations or between political factions within a nation. And that has not clearly declined over time. We actually have more civil wars technically right now, I think, than we have maybe ever had in recorded data, even in the 1990s. On the other hand, there some, almost all these civil wars are small, low-scale insurgencies, so they're not particularly violent in any given time. So, and, but, but it's just, so it's not really clear that that violence is declining. Um, I do think, though, that in this situation, when we have more rules-based orders of which states are, and when we have more checks and balances, I think we tend to have more peace. It's not like an automatic recipe. Uh, and so that is why I think you've seen a trend towards fewer conflicts within these more check-balanced strong state societies, and why we've, we do have more checks and balances in the world, and we do have, I think, stronger institutions, even informal ones. That's why I think even if we have many conflicts, they tend to be low scale. Um, and, and then what does it mean to have a much more multipolar world and a weakening of a super hard to predict? I mean, I think, I think, it, I think to the extent, to the extent it leads to less, like more checks and balances and uh, I think, and, and, and the main, where the main players are checked and balanced, I think it's really stabilized. Fortunately, the other two of the four big gorillas on, on the globe are not particularly checked and balanced, and they've been moving in the opposite direction. Right? Russia has personalized, and Xi Jinping's trying to do the same thing in China. And that, to me, the personalization of power in China is like the most worrisome thing on the planet. Um, and, and we don't talk about it very much. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Hi, Professor Blackman. Thank you um, for your talk. I'm still making my way through your book, but um, I'm curious about two points you make in the book and you also brought up today. Um, one is, you know, talked about how peace doesn't always necessitate justice. Um, and the second point I think you make about um, negative peace, right? That uh, we can go through years of brinksmanship and sort of other forms of um, other activities that are not exactly physical violence, but might be some other ways of showing your strength and such. But um, I mean, one might say that societies that grew up in such like prolonged um, brinksmanship are also, you know, it maybe it's not as ruinous as war, but they're also suffering to a lot of negative consequences. You know, um, groups that are systematically oppressed um, through non-physical violence, and stripping away of rights and being dehumanized. So my questions are, one, do you see if there's a way to have justice and peace? Uh, both of them, and second, um, you know, war isn't always just physical violence that breaks out, ultimately with guns and uh, cannons, but um, what about violence that may not be um, as physical? No, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, so I said the first half of the book was about negative peace, even if I didn't use that jargon, and it's about um, how, how we can lose that negative peace and get to violence because of these basically these psychological and strategic failures. And then the second half of the book, I don't call it, but it's just the past of peace, is about how do you create a more positive peace, which is what the jargon people use for this, where you're not in this brinksmanship, where there's basically lots of padding around you where you don't actually want to go to war. You've got this sort of brotherhood and sisterhood and harmony, which is the other way we think of peace, right? Um, and I try to sort of talk about the way, like, what do you, what can you, what do, what, what have societies done over the long run, a micro scale, micro scale to like to build that insulation? And so we talked about inter, this, not just economic interdependence, but like social interdependence and also, I think, cultural, ideological interdependence. So the, just the idea of human rights and the idea which would have to be created and promulgated and picked up is the fact that I, you, you know, some, Person on the other side of the planet, I actually give a win for their well-being, especially if my government invades them. That should be inherently pacified, okay? because now I'm internalizing the cost to the other group, which I don't even need to get the negative piece. Um, so there's that. There's what we talked about. I think there's rules and enforcement, there's rules-based orders, there's, there's checks and balances, and then I talk about some of the interventions. So, so it's it's my way of sort of saying how like how, what are the common threads, and that's you know it's a it's an incomplete list of ways that 
that societies have achieved this. But to me, they were maybe the most important. Um, and the book was already too long, so a limited list. Uh, but that, but and that's basically part two is like the positive piece. Well, while we could stay hours uh, discussing, uh, we're we're on time. So join me in uh, giving your speaker a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you.